Okay, we're, so we're still in Philippians. We are uh, now at this place, at this verse. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And what does that mean? Where are we going? You know, uh, the Apostle Paul comes to faith in Jesus Christ through this lens of, of his own history, his upbringing, and really the lens of being a Jew through that, that understanding. In fact, if we continue on a little bit in Philippians, if we look at chapter three, verse five, he says, he makes a comment that he's a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? That, um, in fact, he says, even if, if I back up just a little bit from that, he says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He is a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. But he, and he makes this point um, that if being a Jew were an, enough to achieve salvation, then he, he's as good or better than anybody out there, right? He, I, I, if that were the fact, I, I'm the first in line, basically, or I'm at the top because I am such a Hebrew, he's saying. But it also means that Paul, along with all of the, the nation, they have this understanding and this longing of the Messiah who is to come. Right? They have this within their prophecies. They have this within their mindset that the Messiah will one day come. Paul knows that it's Jesus, that he has come. And, and I, but the thing is, I don't think Paul can think outside of his, his rubric, if you like, his history, his upbringing, his culture, his teaching, um, he can't think of being outside of this concept of being a Jew. He was trained in the synagogues and the best schools under Gamaliel. Like he makes a big deal. This is a big, you know, a important teacher. He's right up there. And th so that's just like us, right? All of us are, are, are colored by how we're raised by our parents, the, the churches we attended, the schools we went to, the culture we're in things we're exposed to, the trauma we've experienced, it all influences and gives us our own perspective and, and gives us our own bias. And so this is Paul's, that he really comes from this understanding um, of being a Jewish believer. And because of Paul's concept of, of Father God, whose name he won't even utter, right, because of this incredible fear and reverence of holy God, he has this profound respect for God. Um, but I think far more than that, I don't know if Paul can even speak of God without acknowledging his power and his majesty and his wonder and his magnitude because it's so ingrained in his understanding of who God is. And it's out of this mindset, it's out of this understanding um, that Paul tells the Philippians and in, in turn us in verse 12, that we need to continue to obey what he has taught about Jesus. He says you need to continue to go on and obey that. And also to go forward in our walk with God, remembering the awesome power of God. And then to, as he says, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And it's interesting because when I uh, looked at the, the word used for fear the, in, in the Greek in this reference, um, or I can't remember if it was or in the Aramaic, Aramaic, either way the word is usually most often used in a negative context. It's used in a reference to fleeing or withdrawing from God and his holiness because you feel inadequate or you don't feel like you, you can come before him for whatever reason, guilt, sin, shame, whatever it is. But it also can be used, and, and it's not used as much, but it can be used in a positive sense, right? To fear God in a healthy way. 
And that's what we read in Proverbs 9.10, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? Or the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. That the fear of the Lord is a good thing that guides us and shapes us. That it's wise to fear the Lord. Basically, Paul is, is putting into words how we are to view God, not as a friend or as a buddy, um, but as a holy God who made us and has the power, he says, he says, don't fear men, fear, don't fear the first death, but fear the one who can kill you and you won't have eternal life with me, right? And so now I um, want to say something about that because Jesus himself calls us his friend. Right? If we look at uh, John 15, he says, uh, you are my friends. Well, he says, you know, no one that, he basically says, first of all, that he, he died for us, that he was our, uh, the friend who died for us, or he gave his life for us. And then he says, and, and you are my friends if you do what I command you. There's a caveat there. He doesn't just say you are my friend, and he doesn't say that, um, you are the one who's saying, I'm your friend. He's saying, I as God am saying, you are no longer a slave, right? In that sense, you are, our relationship has changed. Through me, our relationship has changed and I've drawn you close to myself. But he says, you are my friend if you obey my command. And so it's an interesting uh, way he puts kind of a caveat on this, right? And so the truth is though, that he wants a close intimate relationship with us. That's what he's talking about. But we have to be careful that we don't skew that into some understanding that he's our buddy and he's our friend and we forget about his holiness and his righteousness and his power and the difference between us um, and the respect that he deserves in that role. And so he does, he wants that closeness to us he, and he wants that he wants us to know the Father through him. How many times did he say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? And he, he keeps describing himself as the one who reveals the Father, right? And so he wants us to be close to him that we might know Father God in a really healthy way. And that we might be able to healthily express our love for God through worship, right? Through his, to acknowledge his glory. And so the apostle says he wants us to work out our salvation. And it's not in a sense that we have to be saved, right, already, be, or that we must be continually in fear of losing our salvation, um, but to act in a way that he just told us to in the preceding verses. So he said all of these things, and then he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what did he say? Well, he said, see others is more significant than yourselves. He said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. And he said, continue to be humble servants in the model of the Lord Jesus who emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. So he said, do these things, right? Work out, working out your salvation does not mean to achieve it because we know that we are saved by grace, right? And, and through faith, and this is a gift from God. So we know that. So he can't be saying, you've, you've got to work to attain your salvation. But what he's saying is that our love, our lived out life will prove, will be a proof that we are saved, right? Because a heart change accompanies salvation in Jesus' name. And, and this change is spirit-led, and it's spirit driven and remains with us for eternity, okay? So the problem is we can slip, we can fall, we can be lazy, we can be selfish, and unless we're vigilant, this we forget to view God with fear and trembling and we make it too lackadaisical, too weak and when this happens when the holy fear of god leaves us we can withdraw from him because we feel inadequate right so our fear changes from a positive fear a really good thing a positive thing 
that helps us to understand him and ourselves and to worship him in a beautiful way and to a negative kind of fear where we withdraw, right? So Paul's encouragement is, is to not forget the mighty power of God and not to get lazy in our faith walk, right? To keep that humble, healthy fear of God before us and to become, to continue to be humble servants in the world as Jesus modeled to us. And the cool thing is, we're not alone in the endeavor. It's not just up to our fragile strength, right? Our, our, our abilities based on our own uh, who we are, but it's, it's far more than that because in verse 13 he says, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works, or for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So the Spirit of God is working in us. And, uh, and it's not just initially that it's working in us to help us see the truth of Father God and, and his Son Jesus and to believe in them, but to continue on living for Jesus and doing good. He is with us to continue that right for eternity. Now, the, the root of that concept, his will, right, that, that in uh, for God who works in you, both to will, um, is that he wants what is best for us. His will is what is he knows is best for us. And then his will is that we believe, that we mature, that we thrive, that we serve, right? And many other things. And then... He desires that we work from out of our gift of faith, from out of this gift that he has given us of faith, that we work from out of that, which it was his pleasure to give to us and to grow in us. So you see that you're, you're not on this journey alone. It's just, it's not up to you because I think the Lord, well, I know the Lord knows if it was just up to us. Well, there'd probably be nobody believing and nobody following right? We need the power of his spirit to help us to get over our humanness and that lack of desire to, I don't know what it, how, how we even call that in a sense, but that it is because of his goodness in us that we can be good. And so we require that. So Paul is continuing to tell us to work out our salvation, right? So that we are, um, servants who do good works, that, that he re he's reminding us that God is helping us. He's encouraging us. God is your helper, that God is desiring that you succeed and that you are really important in his kingdom plan, that he has a place for you and a desire for you. Now, Paul continues to go on in verse 14. He says that you have uh, eternal, eternal life as a gift from God who is continually helping you. So, don't grumble and complain. This one's hard for me. Don't grumble and complain and argue. You know, I, I have to admit, that's, it's, this is not easy. It is not easy to gr not grumble and complain and not argue. You know, you're, we might think our life is really tough and we're hard done by, but we are chosen people. We are a royal priesthood of God. So whatever happens to you, you know, so whether it's small daily annoyances like somebody parked where you want to back in and load your stuff, <laughs> you know, these minor annoyances or whether it's hardships, real hardships, you have the gift of life. You're in the kingdom of God. So stop grumbling about what you don't have or how bad your circumstance is. Maybe what we need to do is remember our brothers and sisters in North Korea. You know, and, and, and he says, don't argue with others, especially about things that can't be solved or resolved. Don't argue. And maybe that's a good thing. He's saying this to the Philippians, and he's saying it to us. He's saying it to the Christian church. Don't argue over this eschatology that you think you understand perfectly all of you and you all have divergent views and you all think you know it and you're arguing with each other about who's right. Don't argue about that, 
right? Where's the common ground within that? Come to that common place where you understand each other, right? And I, I keep coming back to that, right? Do we believe the Lord is returning? Do we believe we're going to be resurrected? Do we believe we're going to be on the earth dwelling with him? That he's going to rule all things and we have an eternal life with him? Praise the Lord, right? We don't need to be divided. And that's why, you know, we're not a church that's based on a certain theology that if you're going to attend this church, you must believe a certain theology. We don't do that. We don't make a statement that says you have to be this or you have to be that to attend this church. So, because we want that discourse. We want that healthy discourse. We want to challenge each other and grow in knowledge and understanding. And so you're, you're going to find, even amongst the leadership, a divergent view of how we feel about different aspects, right? So, and that's why I, and, and me and Cameron talked about this last night when we were visiting, I don't like labels. So I am not a Calvinist. I am not an Armenianist. I don't have specific things where I nail down this is who I am. That's why I believe in community churches and not denominations, right? Because we're Christ followers and we follow the words of the Bible, the words of Christ, and we don't need all of these things to divide us. So, no, I think I went off topic. <laughs> okay. Let's get back to the passage. Verse 15, Paul tells us, the reason we should not grumble or argue is that our life shines forth brightly and others see Jesus. Hmm. Because if you're grumbling and complaining and arguing all the time, people will not be attracted to you or the Jesus that you're talking about. That the world do who doesn't know the Father and Jesus, they need to see us as a bright light in a dark world, right? That's what they need. A, a perverted world, he says, right? Where, where right and wrong have been so twisted and confused, many can't even tell the difference anymore. But he says, because you are blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, you will shine as lights in the world. That's kind of cool. Each one of us is a little light and we're gathered here, it's pretty brilliant right now. Um, that's, that's beautiful. And this is done, how? By living as humble servants and seeing others as more significant than yourself. That's what he's been saying. That's how it's done. It's done by not grumbling and arguing, right? And it's done by consistently walking with Jesus throughout your life so that your witness is attractive to a world that is lonely and is desperate for truth. And you have that consistency so that people say, well, he does it one day he's like this and the next day he's like that. In verse 16, Paul says, as we live for Christ, we are to hold fast to the word of truth. We will be pr he says he will be proud of us and in his own works even for the Lord, Proud that his life was spent serving the Lord and that it was not in vain. And so he says, holding fast to the word of life. So in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Proud of us, proud of the Philippians, proud of those who he has taught and followed. Paul's joy is our salvation and our faithfulness and holding fast to the word of truth we first heard. Remember the, the, the church in Revelation where that was one of the admonitions, hold fast to your first love, to what you, what you first knew. So Paul, this is what's really cool. So he's telling us this and then he models exactly what he's been talking about to us through this whole discourse. He says that his brothers and sisters in Philippi and, and us, he sees them as being more significant than himself. He's serving them. His desire is to serve the brethren and, and have the, them, have us grow more in, more in Christ Jesus, right? So he says, even if his life is spent, if it's poured out as an offering, that we might believe and have eternal life, he is pleased and he is blessed. He is seeing others as more significant than himself. So he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk, right? 
Now, you think about it. I mean, Jesus poured out his life for us. Paul seeks to do the same. And in doing so, and in seeing our salvation, if you like, he's talking to the Philippians, but we, we bring this into our context. In seeing our salvation being worked out, it gives him joy. It gave him joy as he watched the Philippian beavers, believers grow and mature and work out their salvation, right? And, and I know the Lord takes joy from watching that happen in our lives. God, Paul does not want us to take our God who made us and saved us for granted. And I think when we get a little lazy, when we forget the fear and trembling part, when we forget the holiness of God, um, we can take God for granted. He doesn't want us to forget our first love and get lazy in our faith. He, he has strived too hard <laughs> given too much, right? To watch believers around him become apathetic. And so his challenges are strong. His challenges are hard. They're encouraging. But he doesn't have much room in his life for apathy in a believer. He doesn't have much room in his life for believers who are lazy. In fact, remember he says that, well, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Right? He's a very straightforward guy. And, you know, I think perhaps we just need to be reminded m more frequently in our lives about who God really is to keep the right perspective. And so I know I think, you know, religious Jewish people, I'm not just saying Jews generally, but the religious ones, the ones who study the Torah, the ones you see deep seated in the faith, fearing God, believing in him, they have an understanding of almighty God and his power. The fact that you create a system whereby you don't speak his name because it's offensive to even utter his name because of the holiness and the mighty greatness of God speaks to how much they valued him, how much they understood his greatness and power. And we need to understand God in the same way with fear and with trembling in that positive way, in that good way. You know, keeping a proper perspective on who God is and who we are, his children, or you could say his flock or his bride, because um, we're called sheep, right? We're called his bride, we're called his children, we're called the, the beloved, we're called many things. So depending on the analogy, the, the key is that, that we maintain this healthy, lasting, relationship with Father, that God that grows and glorifies him and his son, right? But notice all of those analogies. Uh, he is God, and we are the sheep of his field. He is God, and we are his children, right? It, it, there is a, there's a definite hierarchy here. We are not God. He is God. And that's why I, I struggle with um, some of the faith systems that say, in their doctrine, and you too will become just like God. That's heretical. There's nowhere that I can find in the scriptures that says we will become, we will be resurrected and have a body like Jesus has, but we're not going to replace Jesus or God in that sense, Father God, or take over for the Holy Spirit. We are still children and vassals of the Lord God Most High. So, it's not that we are scared of God, right, in this negative sense. We don't want that. That's not healthy because if we're scared of him, it's probably because either we have a misunderstanding of God or we've done something wrong, right, <laughs> and we've withdrawn from God because we're not feeling great about ourselves and we don't really feel like we can be in his presence. But we fear the Lord. I think about, uh, I think about we fear him as expressed in the Psalms and the Proverbs. There's so many great Psalms and Proverbs that speak about the glory and the might of God and his glorious creation and just the phenomenal power of God, that God is the maker of all things, that he deserves praise and glory. And then I think perhaps it's at the end of the story of Job where God himself explains to all 
of us his glory the best and he explains it to Job in a way that really puts Job in his place, right? And that is from, I want to read that as we finish up because I think it's good for us to finish with this, really, these words from the Lord directly to Job. And so, pretend you're Job right now. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no further. And here you shall, shall your proud words, waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment from the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Who's ready to declare? Only the Lord. Only the Nord. You know, you think about it. We're so smart, aren't we? We think we're so smart. We're so sophisticated, so advanced, and yet we can't make something out of nothing. Anything we do, <laughs> all we do is mess around with what he's already made. Right? It's all we do. Is we and we usually make a mess of it. We usually distort it, right? We, all this stuff messing with DNA and all the other things we're doing we're distorting his good creation. We're not improving it. You're going to improve on what God did? And, and that's hubris, and that's pride, and that's going to be a problem for us in the future. You know, knowing that God is the sole creator of all things and that he alone sustains us is the beginning of wisdom. So we take joy, I take joy in knowing there's a God who's in charge of all this, who made it and sustains it and who's over it, who's vast and incomprehensible, and then says, I love you. That's incredible. And so along with Paul, we rejoice in our salvation. Amen? Yeah, we rejoice in the continuing work of God in us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling.